Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, today uh, we are tackling pollution, and I found this very modern, awesome picture of tackling. Um, when you tackle in football, it's important that you keep the proper form. Now, I'll keep it brief, but I could talk for a long time about proper tackling form. Uh, but when you tackle, you've got to do a couple things. First of all, you've got to keep your head up. I mean, it's become more, you know, more of a thing lately, but it's always been true. You really have to keep your head up, then you have to wrap up with your arms, and then you drive through with your legs. Um, you keep your head up because you need to see who you're tackling. And you have to wrap up, not just hit them, otherwise you'll bounce off and they'll keep going. And it, your strength, your, really, your strength comes from your legs. So you're not just there to go meet your opponent or say hi to them. No, you drive through them. You have to keep the legs moving. And all that's to say that you have to have whatever you're doing. It's good to have the right approach, the proper form. Well, we are in the middle of tackling tough topics in our series. So it's kind of important before we start that we have good form as well. So here's proper form when it comes to tackling particularly thorny or tough topics. First of all, just like in football, head up. You must see the issue or you can't tackle it. What I mean is if you don't understand the problem, you can't really talk about it, or I guess you could talk about it, but you're not going to make much sense. So tackling tough topics, it, you know, if you want to actually tackle the tough topics that face you, it's going to require some research, learning, and also listening, and, and not just listening to anything, but the best way to listen when you're, when you're going up against the opponent, the best thing to do is not to listen to what other people say about the opponent, as it is to often listen to your opponent or to listen to the other side so you can understand it more thoroughly. In other words, to see the topic, it's going to require both listening and learning. So the second thing is wrap up. Otherwise, you're probably just going to bounce off a tough topic. Now, what I mean uh, by this is, in, in this case, to wrap up not means to wrap up or to hold on to your opponent, but actually more important is to hold on to Jesus. Uh, whenever Christians approach a tough topic, if we lose track of Jesus and the gospel, we're bound to lose the battle. If we don't hold on to Jesus and what he says and what he does, then we'll not only miss the tackle, but we'll probably get run over by the devil. When playing an opponent, it's also good uh, to know yourself. Play to your strengths and make accommodations for your weaknesses. Uh, for many Christians, and this is true of, of all people, but probably particularly true of Christians, our biggest weakness, or one of them at least, is that we want to be right. But as sinners... We're wrong more often than we want to admit. Now, the good news is that we have made the gospel. The good news is God's word has accommodations for this weakness. The law helps us to show us our sin. It helps us to admit that no matter what the issue is, we have sometimes missed our assignment. We've sinned. Um, I've said this a couple times, but it came up even again in our gospel lesson. Jesus said, avoid the, I think he said, avoid the yeast of the Pharisees. Whatever he said, he was talking about avoiding being hypocritical, um, but like the Pharisees. And it's important that we, um, that we uh, actually listen to our Savior, and we don't, uh, we don't think that we could never make a mistake, that we could never be wrong on an issue. Whenever, again, as a Christian, I think, knowing that we are sinners and that we need repentance, any issue, practically any issue at all that we come to, if we look at it closely, we're going to see we've made some mistakes. So we shouldn't be shocked by that. So that's, that's our weakness. On the other hand, our strength is in Christ. So we rely on Jesus to teach us, and, and his insight will help us navigate tricky and tough topics. Um, so in other words, we don't simply rely 
on our own wisdom or on our own arguments or powers of persuasion. We rely on Jesus and the gospel. And um, it's good to remember, too, I think whenever talking about issues, these kinds of issues, is that even when tackling pollution, it may not seem like it, but really our big picture perspective is that a permanent solution cannot ultimately be found in laws or even in science or politicians, but an, the ultimate solution can only be found in Christ. Um, now, we, may, we must attempt to use all these other things in service to Christ, but it's important to get the order right and to use them in service to Christ and not try to make Christ serve uh, some other uh, uh, institution or agenda or whatever. I said early on in this series, and I think the more I think about topics like this and you know, just read the New Testament, the, the good laws, I said, are not really the catalyst for cha real change. Good people are, right? I mean, there's so many ways in which I think that that just seems very true to me, uh, that good people are more important than good laws. And only Jesus can take corrupt people like you and me and make us good. So what does the Bible actually say about pollution? Well, of course, the Bible doesn't say anything about carbon emissions or you know, cute little baby seals covered in oil. Uh, but it does address the core issue and problem in our world, uh, which may sound generic at first, but actually I think is really helpful to start here. The pollution of the world comes from, it's not what God, God originally did not create the world bad. The pollution of the world comes from the fall into sin, as we sometimes call it, and also it's fall out. Sin, if you, I'm sure you remember, came when Adam and Eve no longer leaned on God. It's not just that they ate the fruit. That's not the issue. The issue is that they didn't lean on God, but they believed the devil's deceptions. They relied upon their own wisdom, considering themselves better judges than God. Now you think about it. They, they despised all the good gifts that God had given them, all the trees and fruit in the garden, and they reached out to grab the one thing God had told them not to take. In other words, they were greedy. They, they didn't trust God's instructions. While the devil, along with our own sinful desires, continue to try to tempt us away from our reliance on the Lord. So the devil is willing to try any and every angle, sometimes even when they contradict each other. He doesn't care. All he cares about is leading people towards greed and self-reliance and away from trust and love. And when responding to pollution, there's two, at least two, major temptations, really, uh, that seem to try to get us off track. And, and they kind of go in opposite directions. So uh, on the one hand, uh, I'm not saying it's always this way, but it can certainly turn into this. On the one hand, sometimes the uh, agenda to defeat pollution and stop global warming can become an idol, frankly. What I mean by that is it can become you know, the most important cause. This is the one thing that we have to go for, the goal to which every other decision in life must serve to achieve. So the problem, if Jesus or God's word seems to hinder or be inconvenienced to this agenda, it's quickly ignored or discarded. And there's two really big problems with this kind of approach, making any agenda, really, uh, the number one. First of all, of course, Jesus is our Lord. So, so shuffling his instructions and priorities because they don't fit with ours is never a good idea. And secondly, it just won't work. Pollution, I think of it this way, pollution is a symptom, but we really need to get at the root cause. When, you know, when you're sick, when symptoms get bad enough, you're often forced to do something about them. You might have to take some, some medicine that'll help you with some of the symptoms of your cold or your allergies. But pollution isn't the root cause. Sin is, the, the broken human heart, you might say. If we fix pollution, and even if we were able to turn global warming around, then inevitably some other problems would pop up. Now, again, to back to the symptoms, 
I like that analogy because we might, we might need to address the symptoms. It might be very important, but we really need to address the root issue. Um, uh, the, the other trap of the devil, it's kind of the other way, is greed for more and a pride to refuse, that refuses to admit any fault. Um, it's when we think, say, and act as if we are in charge, not God, as if we are Lord, and we can use the world however we want. It's a different kind of idolatry, but still idolatry. It's the idolatry of self, or we might say of convenience, or of comfort, or pleasure. I don't really need to worry about trashing the world up. I can do what I want, and don't tell me otherwise. I refuse to even consider whether my pleasure or desires or, or decisions might harm God's creation. And, and in this kind of um, error, the appeal is to our pride, human pride, which is extremely dangerous. And, and human pride is um, the wrong kind of pride at the very least, is the exact opposite of repentance and humility. Pollution is, is in, in some ways, pollution is just one more angle uh, that demonstrates how greedy and uncaring our attitude and other people's attitudes can sometimes be and how destructive they can be to the world. Greed causes, of course, companies to cut corners and be irresponsible because it's more profitable. Greed causes us sometimes to be so consumer-driven that we, we make and buy a never-ending amount of stuff without once considering how it might affect God's creation. And, and if, it's, if greed is at the root issue, no matter how hard you try, you really can't make greed or selfishness jive with humility or love for God, neighbor, and creation. Um, it's, and it's not only our problems, but, but even the solutions we come up with often expose the brokenness and the spiritual bankruptcy of this world. What I mean is, sometimes even our solutions are very faulty, or they cause their own new problems. You know, it, it, we can just see sin has left its mark on the world, and, and pollution is a great example of how that has, has happened. Uh, humankind has done all these wonderful things. We've really adva made so many advancements, but tied in with all those advancements is these new issues uh, that come along with them. Well, uh, 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, I think, helps us understand and frame uh, how to, to deal with this, how, what, how to, what we should do. Um, in, in 1 Peter chapter 3, we're told, uh, with the beginning part, great, great uh, epistle lesson, uh, talks about how, you know, some practicals of how we should act and treat each other with kindness and all that kind of uh, good stuff. And then P, it's, it's, maybe it seems like it comes out of the blue, Peter starts talking about the ark. Uh, Peter recalls the, story, the, the famous story of Noah and the ark and the flood. It, but his point is the world was corrupted, um, polluted by sin, we might say, and it really needed a, a, a reboot. So Yahweh rescued Noah and his family and did you know, a super rinse uh, uh, or a long wash. He put the setting on the washer for really long. Of the world and got rid of the world's dirty laundry through the flood. Well, Peter says this world is still polluted. It it was through water that God restarted back then, and it's through the waters of baptism that God rescues us today. Peter goes on, and of course, the whole New Testament talks about how our hope. Uh, it doesn't deny that the world is is messed up and there's problems, but it says really our hope is in Christ. Um, so uh, we certainly, as we talk about, and, um, about pollution and think about creation, again, I, I think we've got a, a beautiful world and some uh, wonderful ways to connect in creation, but um, we should certainly treat creation as best as we can. Um, we just have to make sure we keep our priorities straight and uh, we and put our ultimate hope in God's promise to restore and save creation. Because the reality of our world is, no one wants to admit it, but our world can't simply be dusted off or tinkered with until it works again. It's got serious problems. 
Um, and ultimately, we can't save the world. But God will save us from it. And he will make the new heavens, the new earth, again, a beautiful reading to me, talks about all these, these frustrations and how in the new heavens and the new earth, these frustrations are not going to be, uh, uh, they're, they're, they're going to be fixed, they're going to be resolved. As Romans 8 puts it, we are aching, groaning for a, a new world. And that's why we wait for Christ to return. And that's why it doesn't really make sense to, it's, sometimes it's about what you're expecting, what are your expectations, what's your goal? And when it comes to pollution, our goal really isn't to save the world. Uh, we, if you understand me properly, we, we can't save it. No policy or adjustment we can make can, can save this world. Our, our lasting hope is, is in Christ. We need a, a complete overhaul. Just recycling more or a, a, the proper you know, set of laws won't fix the fundamental problems with this world. Only Jesus and the power of the gospel can really fix what's, what's broken and what keeps causing these problems to happen in the first place, and our, our starting with human hearts and minds. The New Testament doesn't, um, this new change, this new creation that God is beginning in the church, it, it's not coming through legislation, but rather as God changes hearts and minds, including as he works on you and me, as he um, and it's only when humanity is right that we can really start to change uh, the world. Now, I say that, but, uh, but now the other side of the coin is, nevertheless, as Christians, we certainly have responsibility to care for creation as best we can. And the scriptures are constantly reminding us that uh, the world is a beautiful creation of the triune God. And a closer connection to creation, uh, I mean, simple things. I mean, it that sounds fancy, but connecting, whether it be with uh, our, our pets, our animals, or with you know, a garden, or being outdoors in the fall, it's, it's not only a good thing to do, but we can tell when we do it, I think, that it's good for us. It's, God wants us to be connected to creation in, in healthy ways. And, and of course, I think it would behoove us and our children uh, to carefully consider what ought to be done as responsible stewards of creation. After all, Psalm 8 was talking about how we're, we're put in charge. We're taking care of the world, and we should certainly um, not just slough that off, uh, but try to take it seriously. And um, surely there are things, as in all cases, that we as an individuals or as society that we've got wrong, or maybe errors uh, we could repent of and improve upon. Now, again, we, we, and I think this is sort of a relief because the, sometimes the fervor and kind of the, the drive behind, um, you know, the, the, some of the agendas is really, puts a lot of pressure. Like, we've got to do this. It, it's up to us. Um, but I think it's different from a Christian perspective. We can't save the world. We know we're not in charge of saving the world, but it is our calling and our purpose to love our neighbor and to connect with and care for creation. So to me, that's a different, it's a different approach to say, I've got to fix it all. We've got to fix it all. We've got to do all this, all this stuff right here um, that we say to do, and that's what we got to do to fix it versus I can't do all of that, but you know what I can do? I can love my neighbor. I can care for creation. I can try to do, um, uh, uh, to keep that in mind. And, and follow Christ faithfully as I take responsibility seriously. Um, we can't, um, just because this world, we say we can't save the world, but that shouldn't lead us to be um, uh, doomsday or something. We should, just because the world is imperfect and imperishable doesn't mean we should stop loving it, right? <laughs> it's a good thing that just because we were imperfect, and perishable, thank God that he didn't stop loving us, right? Jesus never took that sort of attitude with us, even though we may have looked certainly like lost causes. Um, you know, where am I? So uh, pollution, as I said at the beginning, it's, it's really, from my perspective, it's another example of how our world has problems, how it's messed up, 
And it demonstrates that even, even human advancements and what seemed like victories can manufacture new problems that we, that we can't fix on our own. We need Christ. Um, our shortcomings, therefore, can, can be a, a welcome reminder. A, a, they can humble us and remind us that we're sinners who err and, a, and that our world desperately needs help. And thank God that salvation doesn't depend on our works or on our solutions, but upon Christ and his salvation. And so we remember, we, we try to take the right form and have the right attitude, the right approach. We, we can't save the world, but Jesus can, and he will. And we have been called to love and care for the world around us, following the example of our Savior. With his help, we can, first of all, we can enjoy and give thanks to God for the, the many wondrous aspects of, of his gift of creation, and we can certainly strive to connect with and care for it um, and regularly returning to and are relying upon and remembering God's promise to restore and redeem this world and to one day make it um, the way uh, that it ought to be. We look forward to that promise, and uh, until that day, uh, we continue to rely on him and, uh, and work uh, to, to care for others, including creation. In Jesus' name, amen.